Abu Simbel, the most remote of Egypt's great antiquity sites, the one that's a stretch to reach, the one diehard visitors to Egypt try hardest to get to. 288 kilometers from Aswan in the far south, up against the border with Sudan. If you come this far, you may as well go all the way. But there's just one thing wrong with a day trip tour to Abu Simbel. You have to get up in the middle of the night to get there, headed to a small motorboat that's going to take me across the Nile. I'm here with my new friend Ali, whose brother is coming with the motorboat. It's about 3.45 in the morning, and uh, the ferry stopped running at midnight. Climbing the steps up to the street there, hopefully my tour group representative is there to meet me. just past sunup and we're about halfway I think to Abu Simbel stopped on the side of the road for a brief restroom stop at a cafe there's not a whole lot out here I've been very excited to see this place ever since I began planning this Egypt trip, what we're about to see here. Our temples commissioned by Pharaoh Ramses II in the 13th century BC, one ostensibly in honor of the Egyptian trinity of gods, including Isis, the most prominent. And I say ostensibly because Ramses was just as interested in reflecting glory on himself for both political purposes while alive and posterity purposes after his death. As you can see behind me, the grand great temple as it's called, the large temple of Ramses with his likenesses reproduced four times. The other temple is ostensibly to honor the god Hathor, but it's really all about the beautiful Nefertari, the favorite of Ramses' eight wives. This site is similar to the Philae temple in one respect. If you saw my video from Aswan, this entire site was physically moved over a span of five years in the 1960s from a short distance away. And that was because of the construction of the Aswan High Dam. Had this incredible ruin not been moved, it would be underwater now instead of facing toward the lake. So like Vile, Abu Simbel represents one of the world's great preservation stories. There were 55 nations who came together to spend what in today's worth would be nearly $400 million to accomplish the task. The site at its original location came to be forgotten about for centuries and was largely covered by sand when it was quote unquote rediscovered by a Swiss researcher in 1813. Well, I'm going to make my way inside this temple. This is the the Great Temple, as it's referred to now. I consider the grandest of several temples that Ramses II had built. And it's, without saying, also considered one of the most beautiful temples in all of Egypt. A 
it's pretty crowded in here, as you might expect, but it is very impressive. You would never dream that these splendidly painted walls and the statuary inside here have been transplanted from somewhere else. Given the remoteness of this place, uh, even the Ramses Day, why would this temple have been built here? The answer is political expediency. Ramses went on a spree of temple building in this region, which was then Nubia and is today's southern Egypt and northern Sudan. The Sudanese border is barely 12 miles from here. It's a region that even then the Egyptians were attempting to annex. Building impressive monuments like this one helped impress the Nubians and assimilate them into Egyptian society. And of course it worked. Well, I'm headed into the sanctuary now. If I can find a place to stand among all the people. This room was solar aligned, designed so that on two days each year and only on those days, a beam of sunlight would reach the room and illuminate its statues. That is, except for the statue of Ta, the god connected with the realm of the dead. He always remained in the dark. By the way, those days were October 22nd and February 22nd, believed to be the Pharaoh's birthday and coronation day. Well, as spectacular as it is, it's really difficult to see anything while inside. There are just simply too many people. It's also poorly lit so that uh, there's the admonition, of course, to take no flash pictures, which is understandable. You don't want to damage uh, what's on the walls. But still, it's so darkened that it's impossible to appreciate them inside the, the temple. You walk just a couple of hundred feet, maybe 300 feet, from the great temple to what's referred to as the small temple dedicated to Nefertari, the favorite wife of Pharaoh Ramses II. Nefertari's temple represents something highly unusual in Egypt. It's one of only two temples dedicated to a wife of a pharaoh, for one thing. And uniquely, the statues of both Ramses and Nefertari, each more than 10 meters high, are more or less of equal prominence versus the usual custom of depicting the wives and other family members of pharaohs on a much smaller scale. As with the deified Ramses, Nefertari is cloaked in her own type of deification on the images presented there, presented in a form that more or less combines her with the goddess Hathor. They must have been quite the Egyptian power couple, Nefertari and Ramses, even if there were seven other wives. As much as we applaud the saving of Abu Simbel, the beautiful reservoir of Lake Nasser beside which it sits is both a symbol of triumph and failure. There were entire villages whose people were driven out of their ancestral homes, not to mention archaeological sites buried beneath the surface of this lake. Visitors see this beautiful monument and it's easy to forget what was lost here or come and go without ever even knowing. Well, I'm back at my delightful guest house in Aswan, the Nubadul guest house, about to have breakfast on the rooftop terrace. There's something that deserves mentioning about my trip to Abu Simbel. Many of the tourists from Aswan that go to Abu Simbel, including the one I took, don't allow enough time to fully appreciate the place. You can fly there from Aswan, which will end up costing two or three hundred dollars round trip by the time you, you're transported from the little Abu Simbel airport to the archaeological site. But even so, you're given only about an hour and a half at the site before 
being shuttled back to the airport. I went by minibus and we were supposedly allowed an hour and a half, but by the time you stand in line at the ticket counter, it was barely an hour and 10 minutes. And that's, in my view, totally inadequate. Uh, mind you, that's seven plus hours of travel time. Uh, the ratio makes no sense. It's the tourism equivalent of turning over tables in a restaurant. You can only get so many people inside the temples of Abu Simbel at the same time. And to maximize revenue, you herd them in and out as quickly as possible. So bottom line, it's a great place, but the travel experience, not so much so. Well, my breakfast has come, so I'm gonna eat and then head to the train station for my next Egypt destination, Luxor. Until then, ciao and peace.